Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Our guests every week, those of you who watch every week, come from a great variety of backgrounds. Some of the backgrounds are more familiar than others, as they said in a famous movie, The Usual Suspects. Uh, but we have a guest tonight that comes from a denomination that my guess is a lot of you haven't a clue what it is. He is a former four square pastor. And it's not the game you play with the ball, which <laughs> no. is my favorite game in elementary school. <laughs> but it's a, it's a church and it's a, a movement. We'll find out more about it. But our guest is Kenny Bouchard, right? Perfect. And he's also, I want to mention, a moderator on the Coming Home Network's online community. And I'm glad that we can mention that. We don't talk about it very much on the program. We will later. Kenny, welcome to the program. Marcus, thank you. i just start right off and say thank you so much for <laughs> what you do. This has been a huge part of uh, what's helped us, you know, make our journey. So it's just a, a privilege to be here talking with you today. Wonderful. Well, I'm excited that you're a, a, a moderator on our community. Audience doesn't know. We don't talk about that very much. But it's really a way of of allowing uh, men and women who've gone through the journey right. to stand beside those who are on the journey. Absolutely. And Absolutely. often from the same denominational backgrounds. Although yeah. I imagine you don't run into too many four square Not too many. Folk, folk on the journey. Not too many. The, the closer you get to California, the more the epicenter is there. But East Coast, which is where we live now, not so much. All right. Well, <laughs> let me back away and invite you to take us back to the beginning and start your journey. You bet. Absolutely. Well. Uh, as you'll hear from my wife when she comes on, she grew up in a Christian family. I didn't at all. Huh. I don't come from a, a r religious background. Um, How'd that I, happen? I, I wasn't raised in a, a Christian home. I mean, your parents just didn't, never had it themselves? I, I, uh, my mother actually, and I, I was adopted, I'll say okay, that right up front. Right. I, I was, when I was eight months old, I was adopted into a family where my mother grew up Catholic, interestingly, until she was 12 or 13, converted to Mormonism and then moved here from oh. Holland with her family. Oh. My dad uh, grew up the children of Catholic grandparents and probably a Catholic mom, but they together were not r religious people. My dad was very much not religious, uh, <laughs> underline the not. <laughs> and my mom, I would say, was very open to sp spiritual things, um, but was more of, let's say, a spiritual eclectic. I think she was attracted to, to different things in, in different traditions or different mm -hmm. ideologies. And, but they weren't together in that, and so we weren't really raised in a, a religious okay. home all at right. all. But when I was eight years old, on Easter of my eighth birthday, in my Easter basket, among all the toys and candies, was a little white gift and award Bible, King James Bible with the gold you know, letters on the front. And I was eight and I got up and I ran out and opened my Easter basket and pulled the Bible out, Holy Bible. <laughs> and my parents thought, well, we should give him a Bible. Okay, I was wondering. What, yeah, the, they, they gave the me a Bible. Bunny actually gave you our Bible. The Easter Bunny <laughs> brought it. For whatever reason, my parents thought we should all have Bibles. And it wasn't because they uh, as I would find out about 10 minutes after I opened it, it wasn't because they had a love for the Bible, but they just felt like we should have one. And I remember, and I've laughed about this a thousand times, but I remember pulling it out and saying, what is this? You know, like, <laughs> what's in here? And my mom saying, like, what, what's the Bible, mom? And mom said, the Bible is a religious book written by men to control the world through religion. <laughs> Happy Easter. <laughs> Okay, but I was so curious. It was like curious. holding the Communist Manifesto exactly. here. <laughs> so I got a Bible, and I also got a, a, an understanding of what the Bible was supposed to be. But I had this Bible with me as a little kid, and I'd keep it on the shelf, and I knew it was special, and I knew it was important. And I'd try to take it off and read it. You know, like you think a book, you go from start to finish, and I'd get to about six or seven chapters into Genesis and close it. Yeah. And, and that would happen over and over and over again for the first few years that I had that. And I was growing up in Denver, you know, with my family. And then when I was nine years old, we moved from Denver over the Rocky Mountains to Salt Lake City. And Salt Lake City, you know, there's the epicenter of the uh, LDS, Latter-day Saint Mormon religion. And so I'm, I'm thrust into a very religious culture now. Huh. Everybody has Bibles and other books. 
conversations about God and Jesus and church. It, it's the most normal thing in the world. My family, not religious, we, we would make fun of religious people. So that's kind of our, our, our way of dealing with religious people is to make fun of them. But I was going to school with all these religious kids, you know, all these kids that would talk about their faith and their faith was normal to them. And as I got into high school, um, the little Mormon girls became beautiful young women, you know, and uh, I started dating one of them when I was a, uh, a junior in high school, started dating a Mormon girl. And she found out I wasn't Mormon and she couldn't believe it. So she immediately had me over to talk to the Mormon missionaries. And um, so there I, you know, I have my little white King James Bible <laughs> and I'm talking to the Mormon missionaries. And at the same time, I was taking a martial arts class from uh, uh, my karate teacher was a born again Christian language I didn't really know at the time. And he found out, oh, your Mormon girlfriend's talking to you about Mormonism. I want to talk to you about Jesus too. So I have two people coming at me. You plus, know, plus you'd learn martial arts, so you were prepared. I was, I was prepared, exactly. <laughs> but I've got, people, I've got people in my life talking to me about faith and religion. And of course, now all of my high school friends are starting to turn their minds toward going on their Mormon mission. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's this intense kind of environment that started happening around me when I was in high school. My faith curiosity just got awakened dramatically. Wow. And... Um, I'm reading the Bible, I'm reading the stuff Mormons would give to me, I'm reading tracts, I'm trying to learn everything I can about Christianity. Of course, my parents are talking to me about their perspective, everybody has a voice. And when I was 17 years old on the 24th of July, and I remember this because it's a, it's a Mormon holiday in Utah, it's a pioneer day, I said to a friend, I'm gonna go to the Mormon temple and do a tour and ask questions, I'm just, I just gotta figure this out. So I go there, 24th of July, I'm 17, I walk around, I do the tour, I'm a little discouraged, didn't feel like I got my questions answered. And I start walking off the grounds of Temple Square in downtown Salt Lake City, start crossing the street, and I see this huge group of people carrying a cross down the streets of Salt Lake City. And they're singing and they're carrying the cross and I, I couldn't believe it. I ran into the middle of this crowd, what are you doing here? They said, we're claiming this state for Jesus, you know. <laughs> what are you doing here? And I opened my bag. I'm trying to find God, you know. So I'm one of these strange people that you witness to <laughs> on the street that becomes a Christian. I'm <laughs> one of those guys. Um, and so one of the guys in the crowd took me aside and he starts sharing Jesus with me. Um, these are not a group of Mormons. I, no, these are, these are and, and as you'll hear from my wife, she went she went with a group called Youth with a Mission. Well, this was a Youth with a Mission summer mission outreach to Salt Lake City. Yeah. And they were witnessing on the streets. And here I was, a 17-year-old kid looking for God, <laughs> talking to everybody. And I land smack dab in the middle. And my friend David, he later become a, a, became a friend of mine. This is a touch from, from Catholicism, if you will. He was a former Catholic or someone who had left the Catholic Church and gotten very involved in um, the, the Calvary Chapel movement and all that, ended up as a missionary in Salt Lake. And there he was witnessing to me on the streets of Salt Lake City. And he's sharing John 3.16 and John 14.6 and John 3.3 3 and the Romans yeah. Road and scribbling them all down and sticking them in my Bible. And um, my, my parents would tell me when I was growing up, you decide for yourself when you grow up what religion you, you want to be. We're not going to you know force that on you. So my friend David asks me while we're sitting there, do you want to pray and accept Jesus into your heart, whatever the language was. And I said, I do, but I need to do it by myself. Because that was what my parents told me. I needed to do it by myself. So two nights later, the 26th of July, um, 1986, I believe, I'm sitting on the hood of my car across the street from my karate teacher's house who had been witnessing to me. I said, I'm going to become a born again Christian. Oh, do you want to come in and pray? I said, no, I'm going to do it right out here. I sat on the hood of my car with my Bible and my little verses that the guy shared with me, and I just prayed. I just said, God, come into my life. You know, save me. You know, be Lord of my life, whatever the, the prayer was. And this, like what I'm feeling right now, just, just hit me as I'm sitting there as a 17-year-old kid. 
And this really radical transformation began happening in my life. And at that moment, even as I'm sitting there as a 17-year-old on the hood of my little purple maverick, um, I felt this call, you know, and Catholic lingo would say vocation, you know. I felt this call, didn't know what to do with it, but into ministry of some kind. And again, I have well, no you, religious you were sitting background. sitting on a purple maverick. It's on, on the hood. It's ecclesiastical <laughs> colors. Go. That's some what... royal, some <laughs> royal imagery there. But I felt it, you know, yeah. even from that moment that God wanted to do something special with my life. I needed to devote myself completely to God. And um, so I spent my whole senior year, you know, the, that summer and then my whole senior year kind of trying to wrap my head around being a Christian. And I'm doing that inside of my Latter-day Saint, you know, Mormon context. And I start fighting, you know, with my Mormon girlfriend and with all of my friends at school. And I'm trying to figure it all out. And, um, and, and so my senior year is kind of colored by this. And I know we'll talk about, you know, the journey into Catholicism, but those, those first months and even the first couple of years were in you know part and parcel a journey away from Catholicism initially even though I didn't have any right. sort of prejudice about Catholicism early on um, when I started trying to learn how to witness to my Mormon friends and share about my my faith with them I started listening to um, a radio program called the Bible Answer Man with Walter Martin <laughs> It was like my it was like my diet. Walter Martin, the Bible answer man. Our guest is Kenny Burchard. I want to be clear here. So you were already right away on the one yeah. hand as you'd accepted Christ and, and really changed that there's a dis difference between that group of people with the cross in that big Mormon church. Hundred yeah. percent. Right away you realize right. this isn't it's you're, you're not struggling anymore. Which of these two churches is gonna be a part of you're gonna right. be part of this but it was an, a non-denominational gathering. Yeah, it was it was people from all different kinds of groups, okay. and they were the real Christians. Um, now, and many of them were from from different churches, yeah. but I trusted them. Uh, I trusted them because what they were saying made more sense to me. And I started, as I said, and now you're being fed by the Bible answer man, exactly, who was very anti-Catholic. He was, yeah. and that's why I said my trajectory away from Catholicism happened very quickly even though I didn't have any prejudice against it that I was raised with any more than you would have toward anything. But I'd go, to, I'd go listen to Walter Martin because I wanted his help with talking to my Mormon friends. But then people would call in and say, hey, you know, uh, Dr. Martin, I am talking to a Roman Catholic, and they say this, that, and the other, and, and Walter Martin would say, oh, it's this way, that way, and the other way with the Catholics. And so then I immediately said, okay, the the Catholics are wrong too. So n not Mormons, not Catholics. So I, I kind of checked them off my list pretty early. And then I bought his book, The Kingdom of the Cults. And in the early editions, he has a section in there on Catholicism. And I was like, I, I can never be Catholic. And um, so he was kind of one of the early influences away from mm. Catholicism, because I didn't want to be wrong. I didn't want to believe in the wrong stuff. And, and part of that has to do with you know, uh, the difference between historic Christianity and, and Mormonism. I, I saw, I didn't want to be part of the wrong group. And then I got more and more into kind of the North American evangelical Protestant subculture, Christian radio, music, books, got really into Keith Green. And he had written, when he was still alive, he had written a series in his last days newsletters about all the things that he thought was wrong with the Catholic Church. And I read that, I devoured it. So, you know, Walter Martin tells me it's wrong. Keith Green tells me it's wrong. These are people I trust, They're, they have some authority. And uh, so very early, I, I use this joke, um, we, in my house we like hint of lime tortilla chips, that my early exposure to Christianity was hint of anti-Catholic, you know. It's, it's, it's just in there. Everything's kind of sprinkled with it. And so I knew very early, I, whatever I am, I'm not going to be, you know, a Mormon. I'm not going to be all the things Walter Martin says I can't be. And I'm not going to be Catholic. And I very early fell into a community with the, the Charismatics and the Pentecostals. And in fact, 
um, the, the people who brought these YWAM missionaries to Salt Lake, I, I went to them and said, where can I get baptized? And they said, you need to go to the Vineyard Church in Salt Lake City, Utah. That's your church. So I trusted them, and, 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 that's, and it was great. It was a great initial experience for me, but I went to the Vineyard Church, and the day before I went to boot camp in 1987, I got baptized in the Vineyard Church in Salt Lake City, and the next day I jumped on an airplane and flew to San Diego and went, <laughs> went to boot camp, and I'd been a Christian one year. And, um, and when I was in the Navy, part of the reason I joined the Navy was because I didn't come from a wealthy family and I wanted to go to Bible college and I was going to use my GI Bill to pay for Bible college so that I could go be a pastor someday. That was my, my grand scheme. <laughs> so the whole time I was in the Navy, from the time I was 18 until I was 23, almost 24, I was getting much more involved in church, much more involved in studying my faith. I started um, a couple of years in, I started taking courses from Moody Bible Institute, and I learned how to study the Bible. I learned basic Christian theology. I started kind of getting my, my uh, feet wet in this trajectory toward being a pastor. And um, You know, it's, Kenny is still, as I think back about all these years for myself, it, yeah. it still kind of blows my mind to think about you were a Christian for one year, you're baptized, you're going into the service specifically so that you can use the GI Bill so you can go to a Bible college to become a pastor. Exactly. But you're not connecting with the church. Right. I was going... Uh, you know, there's no yeah. there's no concept you need to be. It's right. just about being a pastor for Jesus. Right. And you could kind of pick your flavor, pick your pick your tribe, pick your group, you know. And, and I, so very early, that that became kind of fun for me in a sense. You know, I would be like, oh, there's all these different choices. And so when I finally left home and I'm in San Diego, I start visiting all these great, you know, uh, uh, evangelical churches that are down in San Diego and uh, Horizon Fellowship, the vineyard down there. And John Maxwell was, was the pastor of... Um, Oh, that's right. Of that's Skyline at the time, and I went right. that's and right. heard him preach, and I'm just kind of like soaking in this um, this epicenter of, uh, of of North American evangelical Protestant uh, Christianity, and dreaming about how I was going to do it, you know, when I when I'm a pastor someday, and just getting very involved in churches, getting very involved in ministry and worship ministry, and and studying the Bible. And, um, and that was the, the path that I was on. And I was there in California for three years and then got stationed on Okinawa, uh, where I was for three years. And that's where I just went head first into my um, trajectory toward pastoring. I, I devoted a lot of time to just like learning how to teach Bible studies in the church that I was going to, which was a Pentecostal church, and uh, listening to... Uh, theology, constantly reading books, and I knew I wanted to be a Bible teacher. You're kind of making up your, you're kind of yeah. making up the shape of, well, I like this guy, and I like that guy, and I like this church, and I like that, and you're, it's, it's, yeah. it's like, um, <laughs> like Legos, you know, I'm going to build my own model of what this is going to look like, and I'm going to take the best of the things that I've seen and create this ideal church, you know, where I'm the, the leader of this ideal church, of course, and, um, and that was the path that I was on. And when I'm when I'm in Japan, that's where I met my wife. You know, she was a missionary there on Okinawa with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, which was the group that brought this youth <laughs> with a, uh, this missionary group to Salt Lake City. I said, "Oh, I have to get to know these people." And my wife and I, before we were even married, we just started doing ministry together with YWAM. We started helping churches, doing worship helping a Korean-American church with their American-speaking service. And we just felt like, okay, we're wired to be together. Yeah, this yeah. girl uh, wants to marry a pastor. I want to be a pastor. Hey, you know, it's a match made in heaven. <laughs> and we just started serving Jesus together there on Okinawa. I kept, you know, taking courses. And um, that was our trajectory. And we were, we'd been married for a few months toward the end of my time on Okinawa and we both looked at each other and said, let's get out of the Navy and let's follow our dream to go and, and become somehow pastors you know, of a church. 
And the way that we did that is we, we left, you know, my time in the military and we went back to her hometown at the time, Clovis, New Mexico, to serve at the church that sent her out as a missionary. And we said, we, they gave her so much, we want to just give them a year. We went back there. And again, they knew like that this couple wants to go into full-time ministry. We start serving. I start helping with worship, start teaching a young adult fellowship and preaching on Wednesday nights, working, you know, in, in as much ministry as we can because we know that someday we're going to have our own church. We're going to be pastors. And, and everything that we did as a couple from, from the time that we met going forward was all about this pursuit of devoting our whole lives to Jesus in the context of, of a local church. And, uh, and, and that was it. Uh, let me uh, insert a question here. Yeah. Uh, good, Ken. As you look back on those days when you, both you and your wife, mm -hmm. Mary Jo, were so involved, everything was ministry. Right. Did you have, even as you look back now, do you, do you sense that that was not just because you and your wife wanted to do this, but that this was an authentic call yeah. from God. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in the Catholic parlance, in the Catholic language, we would say it was a sense of vocation, a, a, a calling um, that we both had, um, that we felt like our lives were meant to be devoted to Jesus and his people. And as I reflected back, you know, a yeah. lot over the years, one of the things, well, what we wanted was to be the most sold out um, version of Christians that we could be. Yeah. And so in our context, when you close your eyes and you imagine, well, what is that? What's the most sold out version of a Christian you can come up with? It's either a pastor or a missionary. Yeah. Of course, my wife had been a missionary. Her parents had been uh, pastors and missionaries and Bible college professors. So for us, we wanted to epitomize our Christian faith in the way that we lived. And we just couldn't imagine outside of those two boxes what that would look like. Well, we've either got to be pastors or we've got to be missionaries. Yeah. And so that's what we did. Yeah. And, um, and you believed mm -hmm. that this wasn't just, I've read it here in Scripture, and boy, it seemed like that'd be a neat thing to do. I think I'm going to do that. Right. But that you also believed that the very idea of it right. was grace. The very Absolutely. idea that you wanted to dedicate your lives to this, mm -hmm. I suppose, and that you had been changed within by Christ yes. to want to do that. Exactly. Yeah. And I go back to when I first prayed that little prayer on the hood of my car, I in immediately yeah. felt a sense that, oh, this isn't just about becoming a Christian. This is about giving your whole life, devoting your whole okay. self to God's call, whatever that looks like. And in my mind, I'm looking for the Christians that are the most... Um, sold out that I could find, and it was pastors. And so for me, I said, well, that's what I've got to do then. Okay. And so we, when we got out of the Navy, we, we served at um, my wife's church for a year, and then her parents went to Africa, to, to the mission field. And we looked at each other and said, why are, why are we still here? Let's move back to my hometown, Salt Lake City. And we moved there, and we said, well, where are we going to go to church? And I said, I know we're going to go to the church that sent the YWAM team out on the streets back when I became a Christian. And that's where we ended up going to church, was in Assembly of God Church. And we went there and we said, hey, you know, years ago, you brought this missionary team here and they witnessed to people on the streets. And I became a Christian as a result of their work. And, and we started going to church there. And within a few months, the pastor of, of that church there who saw that I was serious about ministry. I was taking courses from Moody. I started asking him to be my proctor in some of those classes. He said, why don't you come on staff? To do what? Yeah. Help us with our worship ministry, help us with our young adult ministry, help fill in for preaching. And I thought, I'm 24 years old and I've arrived. I'm a pastor. I've finally done it. You know, I haven't even finished Bible college yet and I'm a pastor, you know, so, so there we were on staff at this Assemblies of God Church in Salt Lake City and it was like a dream. And again, remember a hint of Lyme, hint of anti-Catholic. Our pastor was someone who grew up in the Catholic Church and who left when he was a teenager. And he would say he left it because 
he wanted relationship with Jesus instead of religion. And so and there it was, that, yep. that uh, antithesis. Now I call it the Protestant uh, dialectic, either or, either relationship with Jesus or the Catholic Church. And he, he provided that for me over and over and over again and would teach against, you know, Catholic things. And so I said, okay, I, now I know I, I know I can't be Catholic again. <laughs> but <laughs> that church was where I really kind of solidified my sense of, yeah, this is what I want to do. At some point, I want to pastor my own, um, my own church. And we went through kind of a, a terrible time in that congregation. That congregation went through a terrible time. The pastor of that church left. We left a little before that and moved to California. And where did we go in California? Well, we went to the church where I went when I was stationed in California. <laughs> and within a few months of just being members of that church, the pastor said, Kenny, why don't you come on staff at the church? So there I was again on staff at a church, doing worship, preaching, continuing to be you know, passionate about honing my own gifts, honing my own sense of calling. And then in that congregation, after four years of being there, we went through trauma again. Mm. You know, failure, human failure, human conflict. And we left that congregation, along with multiple other people who left at the time. And in the Protestant way of thinking about it, um, when you see when you see someone fail, when you see a, a pastoral leader fail, you say, or some, some will say, aha, he's a bad guy, I'm a good guy. The good guys leave and they start their own church. And that's what we did. We left that congregation and we went over here and we started our own fellowship. But I said, I don't want to be alone. I don't, I don't want us to be independent. <laughs> And over the years, you know, you collect heroes, um, preachers and pastors and people that you love. And one of the people that I came to love a great deal was Jack Hayford, who was, he's a father in the, in the Four Square Church. And it was like, na it was like nature, like human nature to say, I want to be in whatever church Jack Hayford is um, in. And it was the Four Square denomination. So we instantly ran to Four Square with our new little church that we started and we said we want to be part of this family and they took us through a process of, of you know sorting through what had happened to us and eventually brought us into foursquare and we were there for 12 years as the founding senior teaching pastors of our church in central california for 12 years okay kenny we're going to pause there for the break that we need to go to. But when I come back, I want you to say, what's Foursquare? Sure. You, you know, in other words, what, what did you guys have to do to fit in? Right. Uh, were, you, were you around pegs in a Foursquare church? You know, I'm sure right, you've right. heard that joke before, but uh, <laughs> we'll come back and we'll find out about that. Uh, Sounds after great. Break. See you then. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Kenny Burchard. And I it paused you. You just said that you had uh, your little group of folk, renegades. Right. The little group of renegades. Good, had, good Protestants. Had started your own little church um, uh, as a breakaway. Mm -hmm. and uh, But then you had who you're going to latch on to. Right. And so it, it involved, which is interesting because Again, from a Catholic perspective, the idea of uh, I'm going to go and become a pastor and then find out what church I'm going to become, it's kind of backwards. <laughs> but, right. but so you're trying to figure out what flavor are we? Exactly. And, and you picked four, go uh, four square. Four so square, right. a lot of people aren't familiar with four square. Yeah, I mean, if, if you know the name Jack Hayford uh, or you know, Google Jack Hayford, the, the, it's, it's, he's kind of the, uh, the face of, of four square, at least especially when I was younger and doing this. But four square was a Pentecostal denomination um, started in the, um, the, the mid uh, 1900s by, or the early 1900s by Amy Semple McPherson. It was really around four elements of the ministry of Jesus 
the four square gospel, she would call it. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is our healer. Jesus is our baptizer with the Holy Spirit. So there's where you get the Pentecostal yeah. angle. And Jesus is our soon coming king. So there's this focus on eschatology and the return of Jesus. And that was really the focus that we had as a church was Jesus, 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 Jesus. And these four ways that we would talk about Jesus. And, um, and we, we did all that as Pentecostals, people that were open to in Pentecostal language, the fullness of, of the Holy Spirit and the present operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And that was some, something that I was very much um, um, sold out to. I, I really believed in those things and wanted to be part of a movement or a denomination that believed like me. Imagine that. I wanted to be part of something that believed like me. And, and so we connected to Foursquare and they they took us in and helped us, you know, for those twelve years that we were wow. um, pastoring that church. We were in pastoral work for twenty, eight of those in two churches on the front end, and then twelve as the lead founding senior pastors um, on the back end. And when I was when I was pastoring, I wanted to teach the Bible. I just believed in that. This is you know God's word was it. It was the standard. It was the thing that everything else was about. The Bible, the Bible, the Bible. And, um, you know, Moody Bible Institute. And yeah. the first class I ever took at Moody was what? How to study the Bible, because that's what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. And I wanted to teach the Bible. And so wh while I was a, a teaching pastor, I taught through multiple books of the Bible, verse by verse. It took me just, just the Gospel of Luke took me two and a half years to get through the Gospel of Luke. Um, and, and so that's what I was doing. I was teaching the Bible. But as I was teaching the Bible, of course, I was also studying the Bible. And I would come up with things that I didn't have a place for this in any of the stuff that I had known. And, and just to pick an example, when I was teaching through 1 Corinthians, where, where Paul says... Um, if you've built, you know, on wood, hay, and stubble, uh, or or you've built with, you know, gold and precious jewels, fire will come and reveal what sort of work you have. the The day will reveal it, you know. And I'm I'm reading this, and I taught on that text in our church um, in the early, I think, 2005 or 2006. I taught on that text in First Corinthians that fire would come and reveal what sort of work my life was built on. And when we went home that day from church, sat down at the lunch table with my wife and my son and her parents, who were part of our church at the time, I said, I think I taught on purgatory today. <laughs> and everybody looked at me, I said, I, I did. I think I taught on purgatory today. And I can see the Catholic idea of Purgatory makes a lot of sense. And, you know, I didn't have a shelf for it, so what do you do? I just, I just put it wherever it could fit, and I would go on. And I keep teaching through the Bible, and I'm learning, and I'm learning, and I'm learning. And at some point, about midway through my tenure at our church, my wife was working at a Christian university at the time that also had a seminary. It's the Mennonite Brethren Biblical Seminary in Central California. And they said, Kenny, if you want to come to seminary here, you can just come for free and we'll pay for your degree and you can take a master's degree here. And I said, that's what I want to do. And I wanted to get better at teaching the Bible. So I started a New Testament program at Mennonite Brethren Biblical Seminary, studying the New Testament, the language of the New Testament, the world of the New Testament, the central figure of the New Testament, <laughs> the church that emerges up out of the New Testament and all of that. And that's when I started questioning a lot of the assumptions that were given to me back here in my Mennonite um, seminary that I yeah. went to. And there's this kind of, there's these moments, as you know, on this journey where lights come on and you go, whoa, uh, 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 I've just seen something that I've never really, I always knew, but I've never paused long enough to think about it. And it's in my New Testament program. We're studying the formation of the biblical canon, and especially the New Testament. And the question is, where did these books come from, and how do we know they're the Bible? How do we know that these books are the Bible? 
And my professor, who's somebody that I love to this day, my professor there, says, almost kind of off the cuff, but for me it froze me. I didn't hear anything else he said. He says, so we know that there's a fully functioning church, fully invested in the mission of Jesus, fully forging ahead in the world as the church of Jesus for years and years and years and years and years before there's ever something that you and I would ever call a Bible. <laughs> and I, I think I always knew that was true, but I had <laughs> never paused to think about it. So here's me, Bible teacher, wanting to be a Bible teacher, sitting in seminary, trying to imagine what church would be like without the Bible, the way that I understood the Bible. And I thought, how, how did they do that? Because in our church, when we started our little congregation out of the other congregation, people were saying, we should do it this way and we should do it that way. And I would say, we're going to do church the way the Bible says to do church. Well, as I'm sitting in my seminary class, I have to question that presupposition. Is there a Bible way to do church if they were doing church before the Bible? <laughs> and and, and is, isn't it more true that the Bible emerges up and grows up out of the soil of the church. Whereas in my mind, I thought, well, a church grows up out of the soil of the Bible. And so it flipped me. Hmm. And I started, while I was still a Protestant, while I was still pastoring our church, I started questioning my own teaching, my own presuppositions. And one of the things that I called into question long before I ever became a Catholic was the doctrine of sola scriptura, mm -hmm. because I was forced by the reality <coughs> of history, but I was forced by the reality of church history to imagine a church before there's a New Testament um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the scripture. Mm -hmm. and, it, and then I start looking at other things, um, you know, the whole way the, the church operated and functioned. I'm, I'm starting to read church history. I'm starting to read Christology. I'm starting to now read Catholic authors uh, mm -hmm. that I'd never read before. And it's throwing me into, you know, a tailspin in a you, sense. You aren't in the process losing, you're not losing your love for Christ. Nope. And nor are you losing your love for Scripture. Right. It, it's still there even more it, than ever. Is this what's happening? And, and I, I want to make this clarification because some, I know that, you know, our mixed audience that we mm -hmm. have, Sola Scriptura has a different layers. Right. There are yes. those folk, when they mean Sola Scriptura, they mean only this and not anything else at sure. all. That's the, and the truth sure. is there aren't no Christians in the world that live that way. But fact, because you have tradition and then you have a thing, a scripture in a thing called tradition. Right. Which is the accumulation of the, all the other things, you know, what kind of robe did you wear on a Sunday and sure. all these, you know, when do you go to church and all. And for Sola Scriptura folk, not just the ones that it's only this book and nothing else. Again, right. that, that that really doesn't exist. But it, what's the importance, right, of this book, right, and these other things? And you're talking about a time when this is all there was. Yeah, I had to. This this was in the process of being written and exactly. was floating around, and people had copies. But there's this other thing. It's going full steam down the tracks you know, ministering to the world, evangelizing, bringing Jesus to the nations. And it's not doing that with the Bible out in front of it the way that, that I imagined it had to be done. And so, you know, I called all those things into question. But the other thing at the same time was that I, I couldn't be Catholic, you know. <laughs> um, so I, I'm what my family basically decided to do in 2013 was to let go of it all. Um, I was finishing my master's degree, my wife's finished her, her PhD, and we both, we came to this place where we said, let's try to imagine our lives outside of this context that we've spent so much time trying to get into. Oh. And we let go. We let go. We oh. went to our denomination and we said, it's time for us to step out of this. And we went through a transition period of that church being turned over to another pastor and us stepping away and me turning my sights on uh, how can I put all the things that Jesus has put into me into other meaningful work 
and started working, you know, raising money for nonprofits and and trying to be a missionary in that way. And um, and well, that seems like such a yep, major decision, a huge decision, huge decision. But what happened to us is it took us to Virginia. We left our church in Central California and ended up getting um, a job at a children's medical charity that serves children that had the birth defect that my son had, and I went to work for them to raise money. And while we, as we moved to Virginia, we felt like, okay, we have a chance to start over here hmm. with our church stuff. And so we started visiting churches in Virginia Beach, not to pick one, but just to understand. And we visited probably close to 30 churches. And we would go, we called it exegeting the service. We would go and we would just <laughs> listen and learn. And we would have these questions we would ask like, what's at the middle? What's at the center? What was the theme? What is everything moving towards? And anytime we would go to a Lutheran church, um, a Catholic church, an Anglican church where we actually attended for quite a while, we noticed that what was in the middle was the altar, was the table of the Eucharist. And that was interesting to us. And so we started to become attracted to that reorientation. Because like I said, everything mm -hmm. for me in my tradition was Bible, Bible, Bible. But in these liturgical churches, it was the Bible is there and it's informing so much of what you're doing, but it's really there's this, this bread and wine. Yeah. That's where things are being drawn up and into the center. And we started becoming very curious about what it would look like if we were in a tradition that was more aligned that way. And we couldn't be Catholic, we thought. Um, so we started hanging out with the Anglicans, and then one day, it, it was actually June 3rd, 2018, the day before my 49th birthday, we were coming home from the beach in Sandbridge, Virginia Beach, and we drive by this church in our neighborhood, probably driven by it a hundred times, never looked at it. But I look <laughs> over at it, and it says, St. John the Apostle Catholic Church. And I look over at it and I think, oh, there's a Catholic church there, huh? And I turn back and then I have this thing happen to me. <laughs> like to use a Catholic word, a locution, a Pentecostal word, word from the Lord, right? And it's pretty simple. It says, go to that church. What? <laughs> go to that church, I'm not Catholic. Yeah, go to that church. And so, we had been, you know, we'd been visit, we'd visited Catholic churches, but it seemed in a moment that this was different. This wasn't my decision. This was God, in a sense, directing me and uh, giving me some kind of impression that this is what I needed to do. So I went home, Googled the church, came out into the living room and told my wife, did you see that church we passed by, St. John? Yeah, I said, I think I'm supposed to go there next Sunday. Or, uh, but they have a mass on Saturday, so she says, I want to go. Okay, so we went to mass the following Saturday night, and I'm in there, and I'm, you know, the, the language pulled in and pulled up. But I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't have a logic for it. I didn't have a map. I'm just in it, and I'm saying, God, what are we doing at mass <laughs> at St. John the Apostle? You asked me to come here, and I shared with a friend online, hey, I just went to a Catholic mass. It was pretty amazing. And he said... Before you go back, you need to read Scott Hahn's book, The Lamb's Supper. Okay, so I buy this book. In four days, I devour this book. And he gave me, and I take off my glasses, he gave me lenses. Yeah. This book was like putting on lenses. And I went back to Mass. And if you've ever seen those, those YouTube videos where a family member gives their parent who has colorblindness these glasses, and they put them on and the person starts crying hmm. because they can see color for the first time. Scott Hahn's book was my colorblind lenses. I, I read that book. I put the lenses on. I went back to Mass a second time. I couldn't stop crying. I was like, hmm. I get it. I see what's happening here. And I start thinking, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to be Catholic. <laughs> How am I going to do this? I don't believe all this stuff that the Catholic Church teaches because Walter Martin and Keith Green and everybody else I've ever listened to told me, you can't be Catholic. It's bad. It's wrong. But this 
is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. My guess is that one or two people out there that haven't read Scott Hahn's book yet, what specifically is he saying in that book about that mass that you said, yeah? Well, what are the, what's what the lens, you, if you what will? You, so what the lens is, as a, as a four-square pastor, I saw the book of Revelation as a map of the end times, as a, as a, as, as a map to, to learn like what's going to happen in the future. And what Scott Hahn does with the book of Revelation is he shows that that book is, is a liturgy or it's a liturgical picture. It's a picture of heavenly worship. So he, he, he changed my orientation toward the book of Re Revelation so that I would read the book of Revelation and see that on earth as it is in heaven, and the mass is a mirror image of what's happening in the heavenly places. So when I went back to our parish and I went into the sanctuary, into the church, and I saw the way, even the way that it was decorated, all the imagery that's in the book of Revelation painted into the walls, into the scenery, four living creatures. Well, they're, they're up there on the roof of, of the church. We're mirroring what's happening in the heavenly places. And, and, and it's, it was just all there for me. And I said, I have to be Catholic, but I don't know how. And uh, so I started a journey, my own journey. My wife started hers. She was on it already to some degree, and we brought our son with us. And I sat down at my kitchen table. I said, if I'm going to be Catholic, I've got to sort through the theological issues, you know. And um, so I made a list. I have a note. I still have it at home of 14 things. <laughs> if I can't solve these if I can't get clarity on these, then no matter how awesome that was, I can never be Catholic. And I wrote down all of those 14 things. And then I started a process. I had to read. I had to listen. I had to um, go through a, an intense journey of discernment and go through those, those 14, for me, those 14 mm -hmm. deal breakers and sort through all of them. And um, and I would say the one because because yep. people want to know like what what was the what one the ones, one yeah. that pushed me over the edge goes back to that moment in seminary where my past where my professor said there's a fully functioning church before there's a canonized and agreed upon New Testament well what's behind the ability to do that is authority it's the commission of Jesus to be that church. Not because of what a book says, but because of what Jesus said to some people. So for me, the issue of authority was the mm. thing that pushed me over the edge. Mm. I had to ask, well, who were these people that not only brought the you know, church forward, who, who led the church forward, but who knew in this entire collection of literature that had emerged in the first centuries of the church, who knew these 27 books and none of the others are scripture. That's the church that I have to be part of. And the answer to that question is, it's the Catholic church. And so I had to recognize that the question of authority, and I come back to that over and over in my discussions with people. For me, it's the church that knew what the Bible was in the first place. And if they know that, if they know the answer to that, then they have other insight, information, um, grace from God to be able to continue to lead the church, not only before there was a Bible, but when there was, and in, into the days that we're in right now. So that question of authority really was the tipping point for me. And once you accept that authority, then the, the more difficult doctrines take on a different right. perspective because you're trusting a trusting, trustworthy right. I don't know if I ever heard this phrase from someone, and if they, if I did, credit to them, but if they didn't, well, I'll just make it my own. Yeah. But I, I adopted a posture at, when I settled that question of authority that I would stand under until I understand. In other words, once I, once I said the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus started, founded, and that's still here in the world today, I don't understand everything that the Catholic Church teaches, but I need to stand under. I'm new. <laughs> I'm new. I'm a, at the time, 49-year-old guy, you know. So I'm new. Everyone's new. This thing has been here for 2,000 years. I'm going to stand under 
until I understand. And I just took that posture as I worked through these big questions, and it really helped me, you know. Uh, again, I didn't know your story before our, our time here, but I, did I hear that the, you were connected with the Coming Home Network at all during that time? One of the first things that I did when I started this journey was try to find out, are there any people like me out there? Pastors, seminary trained, you know, people have been in vocation, vocational ministry their whole lives. And, you know, Google is your friend and found the Coming Home Network, immediately got connected on the on online networks. One of your uh, amazing staff guys who's been here, Ken Hensley, ended up becoming um, a voice for me initially and pointed me in some really neat directions, got me involved in the online community. And there I found, oh, I'm not alone. Yeah. I'm not alone. There are people like me who care about all of these different pieces and they want to think it through and process it and sort it out. And the, the, the network there, especially the, the um, community network, the online yeah. um, platform, gave me a chance to do that. But also having people to email back and forth when you needed longer conversations, yeah. incredibly helpful. And uh, which I'm very grateful that you yeah. got involved in. Thank now God for you're it. on this side of the right. pond, you, right. you yourself exactly. are, are answering those questions for people. Yeah, we, we, you know, in that network, you have people that they show up kind of like we did. God's doing something in me. I didn't think I would ever be asking these questions, but I am. I don't think the door swings that way. I think I'm on a, I'm, I'm inside of something where I can never go back, but I don't know how to go forward. And the nice thing about that platform and the content and the people that are there is you discover, yeah, there's a way forward. And the, the language of journey is really the yeah. perfect language for it. Well, and another part of the community, which I've insisted in from the beginning, which the, the staff and shares with me, is built on the idea. And I talked to you about this earlier. When you look back to your early days, you didn't begin knowing Jesus when you became Catholic. Right. Yeah. I was already a Christian. You knew that. And exactly. It, and you're gonna we're gonna hear your wife's story next week on the journey home. Right. And how the the missionaries had such a big impact on her coming to Christ. Right. And to me that's an important part of the way you do your work on the community. You're standing beside people. You're not exactly. push pulling or prodding them into the church. They right. need to be hearing it from God, and you're there to answer their questions, encourage them, um, give them good connection through resources. Absolutely. But it's got to be their decision, just yeah. as it was for you and for your wife, Mary Jo. And helping them to recognize God's hand has been in everything they've been involved in up to this point, but it's in this too. It's in this too, and you never maybe imagined you could do it, but God's in this piece of your journey as well. What was the hardest thing for you to get over in becoming God? You know, a lot of people will point to a, a theological thing. I think I, and I could do that, but I'll point to an identity thing. My, remember what I said at the beginning, I wanted to be a pastor. Yeah. I wanted to go be a pastor in a church. So I would say the hardest thing for me and probably the best thing for me has been letting go of that need to be that guy and just being okay with the, what the Catholic Church is trying to do with me isn't make me a pastor. Mm -hmm. What the Catholic Church wants for my life is what Jesus wants for my life. And that's for me to be with him forever, to be a saint, to be a holy one. So my focus now as a Christian, as a Catholic Christian, isn't about yeah. what I'm going to do for the church. It's about what kind of person am I becoming? as a result of my faith. And it's not about my job, it's not about my position, my title, it's about my relationship with Jesus. Uh, that was hard though, because I, I had to let go of that. You know, one of the most beautiful, powerful prayers in the church is called the Litany of Humility. Mm -hmm. And if any of you on, on uh, listening have ever seen that, you can mm -hmm. get it on EWTN.com, you can find it. I've had it. to pray it a few times. It's, <laughs> but what's powerful about it, and so many things, but one of them, this is, was written by a cardinal of the church. Right. Who says about as high as you can get in the church in terms of attention. Sure. But recognizing the important thing. Right. Is right. cutting through all that. And yeah. we need to do that. 
Exactly. You know, in our own journeys, you, you said that that's what happened for you when you had to step aside from being a pastor to say, I'm just going to be me and Jesus and understand what you want me to be, Lord. What does it mean to be grace? a follower of Jesus? And now I do that, not picking and choosing what I want it to be, but listening to the church and Jesus as he works through the church to help me. So... All right, my friend, Ken. Marcus, thank you so much. Thank you for what joining us pleasure. on the program and sharing your journey with us. And our prayers are with you and, and Mary Jo. And, thank you. And uh, thanks again. And all of you for, for joining us. Thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I do pray that Ken's journey is encouragement to you. And those of you especially who are on the journey and you're wondering if there's a place you can connect with, go to chnetwork.org. That's the Coming Home Network's website. And you can get connected with this community that Ken helps a monitor that can answer your questions about the church. So God bless you. Look forward to being with you again next week.